Hello, I'm Jimmy Carr, and welcome to this radio show, which is called Jimmy Carr's Comedy Cuts. Yeah. This is a show all about jokes and comedy. Over the next half an hour or so, I'll be playing you some of my favourite clips from the best comedians around, and between the clips, we're going to be talking about jokes. In other shows in the series, we've talked about how to tell jokes, and even discussed a few theories about what makes jokes funny. Today, we're going to look at some of the ingredients that go into making a good joke. The elements that most jokes have in one form or another, which were mixed together by a skillful comedian, lead to laughter. If you don't know what a skillful comedian sounds like, I'll give you an illustration with the help of Rod Gilbert. You know, off the telly. I drove down from Wales to be here. I seem to spend most of my life on on motorways, in motorway service stations. What's happened to them? Do you remember the good old days of motorway services? Petrol and a porn mag. It's all you could get. The halcyon days of the petrol station. Now you have to be in there all day. You have to spend hours, don't you? They have to sell you everything under the sun. Every piece of unrelated crap, don't they? A lobby full of stuff that nobody needs. I only stopped for a poo. I came out with a two-man tent. A director's chair and a torch with the power of a million candles, whatever the hell that is. Boo. The first element we're going to discuss is surprise. Surprise is the fundamental joke mechanism, the key ingredient in a good joke, like dough in bread, sausages in toad in the hole, or a low-cut top in an episode of Nigella Bites. Most punchlines rely on an element of surprise, which is why jokes usually aren't funny the second or third time you hear them. Boo. See, that was good the second time. Here's Matt Reed. He's from Sunderland, the town that people from Newcastle think of as a bit parochial. Mm. When I come to London, people do tend to enjoy the accent. Uh, I always get asked to say certain things in my accent. I get asked to say things like, How are you, man? <laughs> why are you, man? <laughs> Apparently it's hilarious when I say a cookbook. I don't know why. <laughs> Obviously, a couple of months ago, it was Dear 12 in the Big Brother house. <laughs> I've recently moved to London because I got bored with uh, conversation, manners and reasonable rent. So, uh, <laughs> very nice to be here. Uh, if I was in Sunderland and I wanted a haircut, I'd go to a barber's, right? Pay seven quid, whack, I'm done, right? That's it. You can't do that in London. You've got to go to a salon. <laughs> right? And I went in and I said, can I have a trim? That's all I asked for. Can I have a trim? Right? It's obviously not what they heard. <laughs> what they heard was, ooh, could you possibly make us look like a gay medieval prince? Right, so... <laughs> I wonder how that voiceover guy is doing since the end of Big Brother. Dear 107, and still signing on. A skillful comedian can judge exactly how much surprise an audience can take. He has to gauge what they will understand, and more importantly, what their points of reference are. Points of reference are incredibly important in comedy. Telling jokes isn't a solo exercise at all. It's actually a shared experience. The comedian must share, or at least reference, universal truths that the entire audience share. This might sound highbrow, but it simply means that both comedian and audience have to agree that Wayne Rooney is a bit thick, Kerry Katona isn't very classy, and Gordon Brown was rubbish. It doesn't matter if they're true or not, just so long as everyone agrees about them. As a further example, comedians always have to consider who is the go-to fat person of the moment. The person who everyone will agree works as the punchline to a fat joke. Once it was Bella Emberg, then it became Vanessa Feltz. For your information right now, it's Eamon Holmes. Here's quite a fat man. It's Peter Ustinov. Seamless link. And we had a sergeant major who was punch drunk. He kept on avoiding imaginary blows. And together with this choreography came a verbal tick. He would say every now and then, like a metronome, Stand up then. Stand up then. Even when you're lying beside your rifle. Stand up then. And as you struggle to your feet, what are you doing here? Get out of my He never understood what he wanted. And I ran into him just after we'd moved to the more salubrious billet. Saw him in the street. He stopped me. Morning, Yutnoff. That was my name in the army, Yutnoff. Morning, Yutnoff. How's your new billet, eh? I said, it's much better, thank you, sir. It's, uh, It's much less congested. (laughs) I know. More room too in there. (laughs) 
he had an assistant who was almost worse. Very erect young sergeant. You never saw his eyes because he affected one of those British military caps which precluded that possibility. But his mouth was always chomping on something. And then I discovered that he was 24 years old. He had lost all his teeth already. And the new ones had been ordered from the Army Dental Corps in 1937. <laughs> and they hadn't arrived yet. And he used to watch parcels arrive and follow them to their destination. When it was me, he said, You know, any cake? Well, I was such a coward, I gave him cake until I noticed he was worse after the cake than before. <laughs> then I changed my technique. I said, no, no, I haven't got any. Oh, I tell you what I have got, Sergeant. I've got some toffee. <laughs> this idea of jokes as surprise was summed up by Jerry Seinfeld. He said that telling a joke is like trying to leap a metaphorical canyon. All the time, you're trying to take the audience with you. The near side is the setup. And the other side is the punchline. The trick, he says, is to judge the gap. So it's not so wide that the audience can't make it across or too narrow that they could just step over and there's no thrill. Yeah, it's not, it's not Jerry's best stuff. Here's John Richardson. When I go out now, I'm a very angry person. If I see things done how I, you know, don't think they should be done. Like when I drive, generally I don't assert my anger because I'm aware I've got a punchable enough face as it is <laughs> without provoking the matter. But it's only when I drive I become Mr. Confident because my brain goes, ooh, John, I've had a quick scan round and uh, you're wrapped in metal now. <laughs> That's the definition of Robocop, isn't it? <laughs> so when I'm in my car, I love my horn. I really love to blast the horn. And there's a lot of cliches about small men who blast their horn. I just do it to get it out of my system. If someone cuts me up, I want them to know they've done it. So I'll just screw you, society. <laughs> the problem is I drive a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> That's not the most masculine horn on the market, that one. What's supposed to come out as screw you, society, tends to come out as stop it! <laughs> I was out driving the other night. It was very late and there was no one around. Suddenly, this old woman stepped out into the road in front of me. I swerved left, I swerved right. It was terrible, but eventually I did manage to hear her. Telling a joke to an audience is a sort of mutual conspiracy. Both the audience and the comedian know that he's going to try and surprise them, but they go along with it anyway. Why doesn't that ruin jokes? Well, I don't know, but I guess it's because they each become like a mini puzzle that the comedian solves for us almost immediately after he set it up. For a millisecond, our brain tries to work out what the punchline's going to be, and then the comedian comes along and lets our brains off the hook. Thanks a lot, comedian, says our brains and we all have a very good laugh. If you look up Bobby Collins on Wikipedia, it'll tell you that he was a Scottish midfielder who played for Celtic, Everton and Leeds United. This is a different Bobby Collins telling some jokes. We're getting older. We're getting better. I got hair growing in places now. You too, lady. You too. Did you ever get that one alien eyebrow hair that just breaks rank from the other one? And the wife's like, what the hell is that? I don't know, I got antenna now. Yeah, I'm a cockroach. Well, that little patch of hair you get above your bum, your lower back. We're watching television, she's rubbing my back. She goes, what the hell is that, a chia pet? That made me want to make love. Here comes the chia pet. Had a hair hanging out of my nose. She walks by, stops, pulls the hair out of my nose. My butt went up. If we're talking about the ingredients that make up a good joke, and we are, we need to discuss timing. If surprise makes an audience explode with laughter, then timing lights the fuse. Almost all jokes rely on the subtle pacing of the comedian. A beat here, a breath there. It's on these tiny pauses that a joke turns. They're the fulcrum points of the joke, where one meaning is levered against another. These pauses are so important that they're often even written down. A sitcom script will often have the word beat in brackets in the middle of a line to let the actor know that there's a corner coming up. Here's Alan Davies. When you're out on the street, now he emphasises this, is very important. When you're out on the street, you must walk on the curb side. You must walk between the lady and the traffic. <laughs> in case a car... <laughs> swerving out of control... <laughs> should mount the pavement and come hurtling towards you, whereupon you must step in front of her <laughs> and deflect it aside. <laughs> a 
all the time. Keep your eye on her. Bound to be fainting. Chuck out an arm. Grab her. Move her to safety. Here's a bus. Don't panic. I got it. I don't know where all that came from. I think it came from... I know where that came from, actually. That came from olden times, when there were no sewers, and there were all faeces in the gutter. <laughs> People just used to lob buckets out of windows, and it would lie there, and if a stagecoach went past, whoosh, all over you. So the bloke used to walk on the outside, and he'd wear a long coat. It would be all velvet or velour on the inside. <laughs> for the lady. And then rotten, dripping oil skin. <laughs> And they step out for the evening like that. Are you looking forward to this evening? I am. <laughs> they used to have to walk backwards all the way home. <laughs> do you enjoy yourself? I do. <laughs> Whenever I go out, I take something to collect all the dog mess on my street. My shoes. You can see how the beat or pause works to build surprise in lots of jokes, especially jokes which are the spoken equivalent of the pullback and reveal visual gag. You know the sort of thing from movies. A teenage boy is confidently asking a girl if she'll go on a date with him. At least you think that's what's happening, until we pull back and reveal that he's just practising in a mirror. In their spoken form, pullback and reveal jokes do much the same thing. They make you focus on a tiny detail before pulling the metaphorical camera back to reveal the whole scene. Emo Phillips is a master of this sort of joke. Here are a couple of examples. I'll have to read them out myself because we couldn't afford the clips. Not after the BBC had to pay for my rider, but it was worth it. She's a lovely girl. My sister had a baby. We could have company over and she'd be there with her breast out feeding him. Cereal or whatever. And... So the other day, I'm pushing him through the park and he's crying because I forgot the stroller. Did you spot the pullback and reveal? Of course you did. Time now for national treasure, Lenny Henry. In the 50s, my parents emigrated from Jamaica to Dudley. <laughs> what was my dad thinking? Bloody blue sky all the time. <laughs> I want hail and sleet and snow. <laughs> all this joyous reggae music. Where can a man get some Des O'Connor? We need to pack your bags, we're going to Dudley. <laughs> they made me go to church every Sunday. The Pentecostal Church of God in prophecy. See, that's a black name. <laughs> White churches are always called things like St. Thomas's. <laughs> we're all outside going, St. Thomas's what? St. Thomas's epiphany of the shining light of God in Christ in West Bromwich? <laughs> now that's a name. You arrived late for church. Sorry I'm late. I was reading the sign. <laughs> it's as good as Stephen King. <laughs> I think we sometimes use jokes to make sense of a strange and unfamiliar situation, like when we find ourselves in a completely alien culture. Here's a good example from reluctant traveller Jeff Green. No show could, um, could be uh, complete without a uh, fallen frank demolition of my uh, honeymoon. So it was horrendous. <laughs> right? Me and the wife, because we got married in Australia, and we came back uh, via Indonesia. We went to Indonesia in the rainy season. If you've not been, don't bother going, right? Just cover your whole body in deep heat, <laughs> get into the shower for two weeks, <laughs> and take a course of laxatives. <laughs> it's exactly the same. Folks. The worst holiday of my life. <laughs> You're just in your hotel room going, make it stop, make it stop. <laughs> I'm ashen. For two weeks, I'm ashen. I'm the colour of tracing paper. Right? Just ashen, walking around. This is my holiday of a lifetime. Oh, no, just... oh, it's horrible. And just, the wife says, You've got to, they've got to do something. Let's do something today. And I went, OK, so we're going up a volcano. We've got a volcano in Indonesia. It's an active one, right? You can go up it if you bloody stupid. You know, we thought between the armed militia and the dodgy transport, we weren't getting enough danger in 